Nahuye Te Awe Kotoku grew up in a traditional Māori community. All around her she saw women with their faces beautifully inscribed with patterns from the past. Now a professor of Māori cultural studies at Waikato University, she's published a book on the art of Tamoko. Throughout Polynesia, the adornment of the skin was not only a rite of passage, but it was a form of very personal and creative self-expression. For young women, it occurred around the time of the first menstruation because it enhanced her physical beauty. For young men, there was the taking of adornment from adolescence as well. People didn't go and ask for them. The honour was bestowed upon them. People were actually designated by their tribes. Hani Huata is a Māori language teacher. And it was to show their chieftainess status or their lineage, but it was also about trying to develop that person as a leader. The Moko indicated genealogy, rank, accomplishment. It represented masculinity, beauty, warriorhood, identity. So don't use that word tattoo. Before the arrival of Cook in 1769, the principal instruments used were made of albatross or human or other bones, cut down to a very, very fine blade or comb-like serrated chisel edge. And this tiny hoe-like instrument would be tapped into the skin. It was a very simple, rhythmic, usually quite painful process. The resulting facial tattoos were so captivating they were painted by a 19th century portrait artist called Charles Goldie. These majestic images are now on show in museum collections around the world. Dr Paparangi Reed's great-great-grandfather was one of those chosen by Goldie. One of the early impressions when I was a young child was having a portrait of my grandmother's grandfather in the living room all the time as an essential presence. But also, very much part of that presence was his moko, was his full face tattoo. Has anyone else got a moko in your family? My grandmother didn't have it, my great grandmother didn't have it, my father didn't have it. Probably because during that time, as part of colonisation, it was seen as not the right thing to do. Everyone was into assimilation and making their way forward and leaving some things behind, including facial markings. In the 1970s, historian Michael King reported knowing of only 70 surviving female elders who had their chins inscribed with moko kawai. In recent years, as part of a general resurgence of Māori culture, moko has begun to appear again, especially among Māori women. We've got a major struggle on our hands because we're so dominated by Western media about what is beauty and it's a lot of Western models of beauty and a lot of it is size related, a lot of it is uh, colour related, a lot of it is look related. So Barbie would have us believe that our facial moko should only be lipstick and eyeshadow. The answer is no. Our facial moko should be what we decide is important from the past, our past. And moko kawai, the woman's facial moko, it's more us than Barbie. Choosing to have a moko is not a decision most Māori women take lightly. It's often done to mark a significant event and performed as part of a communal ceremony. Te Arawa Tairakina was one of several women in her tribe to have her chin inscribed to commemorate the passing of their Māori queen. Sixteen women from Tainui, from our marae in Tūranga Waiwai, had the moko done. We had all these wonderful people from the, the East Coast, and they came to support us, and there was about 50 of them, and they had the moko as well. There was singing and dancing and laughing and cheering, you know, while we were getting done. And that was a very special occasion for all of us, really. It was a huge event. The best thing for me was to be able to do it with all these other queer female elders, all these really hard-working nannies that I'd seen lie down and get that gun tattooed into them and not make a sound and sit up with this big smile. It's my grandmother's design. When I look in the mirror, 
I always greet her. I say, hello, Nan. You know, when I look at the moko, because it was her moko. So you're wearing your history on your face. Yes. How does yes. that feel to wear your history on mm, your face like that? Sometimes sad. I had to go through a, quite a lot of things. And my um, grandmother had a terrible time with the colonisation process. We've got a better life. That's how I look at it. There are only a handful of female Māori tattoo artists. Christine Harvey is one of them. She takes no less than a year to get to know someone before she'll consent to do work on their face. Before she starts, she says a prayer to protect and inspire her work. We're working with your sister tonight. Tell me, what are you doing on her? We're making puhuro pattern on uh, Shelley's forearm. This pattern is well known for being on the underside of the waka, our traditional canoes. So every little image pertains to our history, our ancestry, and our natural world. There you go. That's the outline. <laughs> oh, that's just so beautiful. What do you think? I love it. <laughs> Although Shelley loves her new tattoos, she's not ready to have her chin done yet. It's your life. It's not just a mark on your face you wear your moko like how you live your life so i would want to be pretty fulfilled and feeling pretty satisfied with where i'm at before i'd even think about it i would ask that people who want to get kawai moko that they don't drink or do drugs i just think uh when we put our work onto people's faces it's a a great thing and to see Someone wearing moko kowat, and they were unable to talk or express their feelings because of drugs or alcohol. It would really it make me feel really upset and disappointed, I suppose. It is deadly serious, but it's not. You have to love it and live with it. You have to engage with it every day. You have to enjoy it every day. It can't be a heavy burden. It has to be liberating, and it has to lighten your step and lift your spirit. How did you feel after you had it done? I think I continued smiling for about a a year or 18 months because I loved it, yeah, I still do. Every day I love it. It is quite literally wearable art. Unlike much wearable art, however, it can't be removed and placed back in the wardrobe or on the wall. Your face can become a canvas. You can collect a piece of art that you will take with you forever, that no one can buy or sell, that no one can take off you. Facial images that can cause a variety of reactions, as Nahuya has found out. She remembers one incident at a shopping mall in Auckland. I was sort of trundling along and coming towards me, was a majestic North African in full burqa. She was pushing a pram. We locked eyes and she just kept looking at me. Suddenly the pram crashed into one of the rubbish tins in the middle of the mall and she jumped back and I looked at her and she went on and I thought she was looking at my face. I wear my strength upon my face It is an international, intercultural marker of female beauty. Women have ornamented the central panel of their faces, but particularly the chin in the cultures of Ainu, northern Japan, of North Africa, the Arctic, certainly of the Pacific. So what we wear here in the Māori world links us with a sisterhood, with a sorority that is throughout the planet, and that feels really good.